Hello and welcome to the Financial and Grants Management Overview for the 2016 SIF Classic Grantees. My name is Lisa Bishop and I am currently the Grants Officer for the Social Innovation Fund and will be your presenter today. What we hope to do is to develop knowledge about effective financial and grants management, share some common challenges and also opportunities for management for financial management growth, and explore ways to enhance and improve your current practices. This information today is not comprehensive, however, we feel it is the, the most important thing that you need to be aware of as far as CNCS policies, federal laws, rules and regulations, our grant terms and provisions, as well as generally accepted accounting and financial principles and practices. Please note that you may also impose additional requirements on your subgrantees beyond what we discussed today. There are some key characteristics of highly effective financial management that we want to put forward to make sure that you understand what the basis of this presentation is. There should be written and followed policies and procedures that are well known by all key staff who have to use them, that staff are qualified and trained particularly on financial issues, that there are effective communications for everyone who's involved with the project, and this is particularly important when we think about financial staff and program staff, that the, ultimately the success or the failure of the project is dependent on everyone, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, and so making sure that there's constant and effective communication will be a, long, a, a major factor in helping you get there. That there's also succession planning and cross-training. Uh, we have seen too often where there might be one person who's responsible for something like criminal history checks. That person leaves and then the people who remain have to figure out the status of everything, how to implement, how to execute, how to monitor. And so again, we would just encourage succession planning and that cross-training of staff who might have to eventually play a role in the project. And then from a governance perspective, that there's an active board that's informed, uh, and particularly the finance committee, that they are aware of the fiscal requirements you may be under, as well as your current budget, your budget status and any key federal grants that you have. And then what we like to call self-check is to make sure that you're, you're constantly checking yourself beyond what's required for reporting and other things so that you know where you are, what's going well, where there's challenges, where there might be opportunities for continuous improvement. Here are some of the key components of effective financial and grants management. Uh, for us, it really does start with the regulations and requirements that are both uh, federal at the most at the generalist level, and then the corporation uh, program specific with the Social Innovation Fund, and then anything again that your organization may uh, impose on top of those items. That there's key financial management principles. That there are again written and followed policies and procedures that are widely known by all who need to use them that there are strong internal controls, that there are solid and consistent practices for applying administrative costs, that everything is documented, particularly expenditures, and I think it's important to note that our, our philosophy is that if it's not documented, it didn't happen, that there are, again, strong and consistent principles for how you record and apply match to your federal grant, that there is effective and efficient and on-time reporting and budgeting, a key component is also then making sure that there's external audits and site visits to, again, both look for areas of success, but also areas where there may be opportunities for improvement. And then when the grant is completed, to make sure that the closeout is done in a timely, effective, and accurate manner. All right, let's spend some time on regulations and requirements. So today's presentation and, and most of the interaction you'll have with the Office of Grants Management really falls uh, around the items that are on this slide. So I would encourage you to save this, to share it within, widely with people within your organization who may have a role. Um, there are federal, the federal grant guide, guidelines that are applicable are around administrative requirements, which are the 40, 45 2 CFR, 2 CFR um, cost principle, which is going to be two CFRs, and then the audit requirements, which are also in two CFRs. And the specific citations are throughout the, throughout the slide, depending on the type of organization that you have. It's also important to note that any organization that expends over 750000 in federal funds in a fiscal year is also subject to an A133 single audit. So what is two CFR? 
It outlines the cost principles for federal grants, what's allowable and unallowable costs, indirect costs and how to apply them, administrative requirements that include then things like your accounting system, documentation, uh, record retention, and then finally audit requirements based on the amount of federal expenditures you have and what uh, also what are the key components of those audits. And so uh, encourage everyone to become very, very familiar with these key parts of 2 CFR. Uh, keep in mind that they are written at a high level and broad because they are applied again across all federal grants. The corporation then breaks down some further things as the, as the cost principles apply to our funding. And finally, your organization may again impose more restrictive measures on top of what we're already requiring of you at the, at the corporation and at the federal level. What are allowable, reasonable, and allocable costs? This is really key. It's a big part of all of the budget reviews that we did even up until you, you received this award. We look for costs that are allowable. It must be within the award limitations, consistent, documented, and then reasonable and allocable. So the cost principles uh, define reasonable as a cost that does not exceed what a prudent person would do on this, under the circumstances at the time the decision of the decision. And so this is, again, this is where there is some subjectivity uh, and we will work with you and your program officer to determine if it's reasonable, not just as a cost, but reasonable for the specific project and the outcomes that you've identified for that project. And then allocable, this is also really important. It needs to be treated consistently with other costs incurred for the same purpose in similar circumstances uh, and that it can be distributed across the award proportionate to the benefits received. So a key area where this comes up often is staff alloc time allocation. If someone is not 100% on a project, they may be 75% on one project and 25% on another. We need to make sure that it, that is allocated in a way that is consistent and it makes sense across both of those projects and then it, that it's clearly documented uh, what the time and effort are on the two projects so that we can tie it back uh, very easily, whether it's us or an auditor or someone else who may be questioning it in the future. Accounting systems. The first one is really, really important. We need to be able to tell what's grant versus non-grant related expenditures so that we can see if, if costs were charged appropriately to the federal grant. Uh, and then this could be how the accounting codes are set up. It could be any kind of other coding and really any reporting that you do for us should be based on your, your own system. It shouldn't be an off the books accounting system. So we are very agnostic into how you get there as long as you can meet this, this distinguishing fact as well as some others. You also need to be able to identify the cost by the program year. Most of our grants are multi-year grants, and so it's going to be important to see which award the specific expense is, is being charged to and make sure it was budgeted for that year and that the costs are budgeted by the correct budget category. So things to think about as you're reviewing your accounting codes uh, to, to f effectively implement this grant. And then you also need to be able to uh, differentiate between direct and in indirect costs and administrative costs to make sure that it's clear what's a direct project expense and what's part of your pooled indirect costs based on whatever kind of agreement you may have with us or the use of the federal de minimis rate. And then especially if you have multiple grants from us or any other grant source, making sure that you can identify the award by gr and grant separately from each other so that it's very clear which award uh, the expenses and the other things related to it in the accounting system tie back to. And again, this is where the, the best test is to have someone who may not be familiar look at, look at samples and see if it makes sense to him, to him or her so that they can help you figure out how to move forward. Uh, again, your accounting system needs to be able to provide financial reports, both the summary and detailed uh, to management, to the board, to others who may request it. Uh, to be able to actually show very clearly what the budget to actual looks like. So everyone, I think, knows that budgets are really just roadmaps, and that's fine. That's what we would expect, especially for a multi-year project. Uh, however, you then need to be able to show what the actual expenditures are at a point in time as well as over the history of the budget to be able to make sure that that's being monitored and tracked appropriately. And then it's also got to correlate, again, to any of the financial reports that you're going to submit to the corporation uh, so that it's very clear if we, if we ask questions or need more information where those reports were generated from and that it's not dependent on the person who may have, who may have created it and submitted it at one point in time. 
this is also something that we really try to highlight with grantees, especially new grantees, that whatever accounting system you use can properly segregate the funds uh, between the types of grants you have. So this is our visual to show that, that you may have three different grants at any one time in your system. It has to be very clear which ones are come from what, what different funding sources, particularly if you've got multiple federal grants, because there will be similar requirements from other federal agencies to be able to track them and make sure that they're not commingled in any way. policies and procedures. This will be a common theme through all of your engagement with us. They've got to be written documents and they've got to describe what the policies for operation are, which is what is actually to be done, the procedures necessary to make them happen, how it will be completed. And then again, all staff need to know these documents, need to live by them, need to be able to refer them. They cannot be something that are written, you know, once every, written every once and then updated every 10 years. Uh, they've really got to be a constant part of the operating practice. Uh, all the documents should be kept up to date. They should be reflective now of the uniform guidance. So if you have policies that were created before December of 2014, you may want to go back and make sure that they meet all of the requirements in 2 CFR. Documents should be able to explain the rationale uh, and include any backup. And I think the, the best test for this is if someone who is not familiar with the project at all were to look at it, could they tell what the expenditure was? why it was made, how, the, how it was allocated to the appropriate funding source, and any supporting documentation that helped tell that story. And again, documents must incorporate all of the regulations and our terms and conditions, um, and then maybe more restrictive, um, you may add additional restrictions to your policies and procedures as your organization sees fit. Let's talk about internal controls. Internal controls are critical. They improve accountability to all of your constituents, which includes us, trustees, funders, and most importantly, the general public, taxpayers. Um, they also help your organization achieve your own internal performance and budget targets and to help you know, frankly, if you're meeting them or not before you get to the end uh, where it may be too late to make a, co a correction. They improve the reliability of financial reporting. If you have different people who have different responsibilities uh, through segregation of duties and other things, then you're going to be more likely to reduce uh, error. We'll help you improve compliance with all of the requirements that your organization faces. For us, it's really important that it both prevents the loss of public resources and public assets, and that it also uh, prevents the loss of public trust. And then, Long term especially, it reduces your legal liability and exposure to risk if you've got strong internal controls. So who's responsible for internal controls? We could really just stop after the first word on this slide, but we'll walk through it. Uh, everyone has some role with internal controls. Even knowing that you don't have a specific role is part of internal controls, and so it's got to be clear who's responsible for what, where those lines are, where there's got to be checks and balances in place. Um, and then the roles obviously will vary depending on the level of responsibility. So you have executives, directors, managers, and then each individual who may have any kind of role uh, within their specific job responsibilities. This slide goes through all of those in more detail. Uh, hopefully it's pretty, it's pretty clear what, the, what we've identified as some potential roles. It's obviously not exhaustive, but it, it is something to be thinking about, especially if this is your first federal grant. So what does it mean if you've got a good control environment? There's a positive atmosphere. The existence of, there's an existence of a code of conduct and code of ethics. There are written job descriptions, and I would add that they're also updated to be, reflect current responsibilities, just like with policies and procedures. Job descriptions are not a lot of good if they're not current, and it seems simplistic, but often if we're reviewing uh, job descriptions, they haven't been updated even to reflect a, a new corporation grant yet. So that's, that is a part of our review if we do a site visit or desk review often. Uh, so just a heads up there. That, that your organization has appropriate and timely communications with the board of directors and particularly, again, the finance committee so that they're aware of the organization's uh, st status at any given time. That there are clear human resource policies around how to hire, train, promote, and compensate your employees fairly and equitably. That employees feel safe if they believe that there's, they, they are a part of or have seen something that's inappropriate, that they're not going to fear retribution from reporting it. That there's a clear chain of command, and this ties back somewhat to internal controls, that it's really clear who's responsible for what, who has decision-making authority over different parts of the organization. 
and again, that there are clear written delegations of those authorities and responsibilities that are widely known by everyone in the organization. This is just a summary. I think the two that I really want to call out are the, the last two, that there's a system to track participants and employees' activities, and so this is in part time and effort reporting, but it may, look, it may include more than that depending on your specific organization and your, even with your SIF project. Um, and that there's a system to follow up on problems. We know that, that no organization is perfect, and so uh, identifying the problem as quickly as possible is important, and then also ensuring that there's really timely resolution to the problem. Uh, that, that will mitigate, mitigate your risk. It will also uh, minimize any costs that we have to disallow, which is probably going to be how this would come up uh, in your grant with the corporation. And so just, again, making sure that there's both a an environment that enables people to feel comfortable reporting it, and then also making sure that there's the right resources to be able to address problems that may arise uh, throughout the course of your project. Administrative costs. There are basically two types of costs. The direct costs, and we touched on this earlier, are the, those, those costs that can actually be tied directly to the project. Um, often I would say they're costs that you wouldn't, you wouldn't incur if you didn't have that project. So those are costs that should appear somewhere in the actual direct budget. Indirect costs are expenses that are related to the overall administration of an organization that happens to be receiving funds from us. So things that might inc be included in here are information technology, rent, um, utilities, phones, anything like that, uh, and you will either have a, federal, a negotiated uh, federal indirect cost rate with us or another agency, or you can apply what we call the de minimis rate. And if you have questions about those options, please feel free to reach out to me at any time. Documenting expenses. Again, document, document, document. We need to know how you incurred the expense, why you incurred it, and knowing those two things will likely help us determine that, that they were allowable, allocable, reasonable, and necessary. So key themes you'll continue to hear from us. Here's some basics. You, it, you need to make sure that you also retain your documentation. So tracking what's coming in, um, enabling you to review it, providing historical evidence, especially if you have changes in leadership, changes in uh, funders, other people who want to learn about the work who may not be, have been involved at the time that some sort of expense was incurred. The other thing that's really important, and it's not um, something that we necessarily focus on as much as we probably should, is that by documenting a project over time, not just the financial aspects, but all aspects, you also get to see the evidence of accomplishments in a way that you might not see if you're in it, or th see or think about if you're in it on a day-to-day -day basis. And then, um, one of the necessities of our world is that it also helps you better prepare for an audit whomever, by whomever may be conducting it. So please make sure that if you're not already familiar with uh, the corporation's record retention policy that you're focused on that and that you then establish your own written policy that is at least uh, as stringent as ours. Match. So when, when we look at our corporation budget, there, there are two types of budget and expenditures. They're either on the federal share, which is part of the grant that you actually receive from the corporation, or they're part of the grantee share, which is actually the, what we also call match. Uh, please note that we treat items on both parts of the grant equally. So if it would not be allowable on the federal share, it would not be allowable on the grantee share. We also require SIF grantees to provide six, uh, justification and documentation of their match sources, both at the time of award, so as part of your budget process. If you didn't already provide your source of funds, we asked for that, and what we're trying to do is make sure that you're on target to meet what you said you're going to do, because there are activities that correspond to both the federal and grantee share, and we want to be able to know that there's a, a solid roadmap at the beginning and then monitor that with you over the course of the project, so that if there are issues, um, we're able to identify them quickly and figure out how to course correct. What's acceptable match? match. Cash contributions uh, are accepted as part of your cost sharing, uh, and they must meet all of the following criterion. They, be, they have to be verifiable for, from the grantee's records. So you have to be able to show the source of that cash, the intent of it, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about what that means, and then be able to document it over time. They've got to be 
necessary and reasonable for the, the implementation of the project, and this, uh, this goes uh, right along with the same thing we would expect of the federal share. The contributions also have to be allowable under those same OMB cost principles that we talked about, so reasonable, necessary, allowable, and allocable. And they cannot be paid by the federal government under another federal grant award unless you have written authorization from that federal agency to do so. Uh, so this will be something that we'll ask you for. If you show other federal sources as match, we will ask for documentation that you're allowed to do so. And then the, the match also has to be provided in the approved budget and allowable under the specific program guidelines. This, finally, it has to confirm to all the other terms and conditions of, uh, and OMB circulars. Financial budgeting and reporting. Here's some things to keep in mind, and some of it will sound similar to what we've already discussed. Make sure that you prepare all of the financial reports, particularly for the corporation, using your organization's accounting system so that it's clear uh, where the information came from and reducing any kind of potential error from any, any other way that you might report it. Make sure that it's reviewed and reconciled for accuracy before you submit it. This is another good opportunity to have someone who may not be as directly involved review the report to see if they can identify any, any concerns or questions that they have that may then impact what you finally submit. Make sure that you, that you retain all of the key documents and supporting information so that you're able to uh, tie it back if it's ever questioned in the future. And then please, please, please submit all reports on time. Um, we can grant extensions in certain cases. However, it is something that we monitor our grantees on because the deadlines are, are set for a reason and we, people sign off on those deadlines. And so uh, we want any kind of extensions to truly be rare exceptions. Here are the three major reporting requirements for CNCS grants. There are two federal ones. There's the Federal Financial Report, or FFR. This is something you'll submit twice a year to us in e-grants. What we're really looking forward here is to monitor your expenditures against your overall award, and we're looking at both the federal and match expenditures, as well as subgrantee for SIF grants. There's another report that has a similar name, the Federal Financial Report, Federal Cash Transaction Report is submitted quarterly to the Payment Management System, which is the entity that actually disperses our funds to grantees. And what the Payment Management System is most interested in is the cash on hand. So they want to make sure that if you're submitting payment requests to them, that you're then drawing down those funds quickly and expending them quickly so that you're, and you're not holding them, because uh, there are all kinds of penalties uh, if you hold funds too long. And then finally, there's also progress reports. These are going to be submitted quarterly to with the corporation to your program officers, and this is where you'll be looking at measuring your uh, progress towards those specific performance measures and other outcomes in your proposal. Budget management. This is also another key slide to make sure that everyone involved with your project is aware of. There are certain items for which you must get prior approval from the corporation. And these approvals specifically have to come from your grants officer. So even if you initiate a request to your program officer, ultimately the grants officer has to be the one to give you written permission. And there, there are costs that are described in 2 CFR. Some of these are, include uh, overtime, pre-award costs, and then rearrangement and alteration costs. There, there are more that are outlined more specifically, so please read those, become familiar with those, and make sure that if you're considering any of them uh, that you're actually requesting prior approval before incurring the expense. All purchases of equipment over $5,000 using grant funds, uh, unless it's already specified in the approved application and budget that was submitted to the corporation. And then cumulative or aggregate budget line items that amount to 10% or more of the total budget. So this is both, both, again, the federal share and the grantee share. If you're recommending a change that is more than 10% of that total figure, you need to get prior written per, a, approval through an amendment process. It's not hard or cumbersome. It's not something that we frown upon uh, to try to help you do. So please don't hesitate to reach out, especially if you're not sure if what you would want to do would actually trigger uh, the need for a budget amendment. Another piece that we want to just make sure that if you're not already familiar with, that you focus on very early on, are criminal history checks. These are actually required by federal law. Uh, no staff who are, who are charged on the budget um, 
or excuse me, for staff who are charged on the budget uh, with no access or only episodic access to vulnerable populations need, need two checks. They need the NSOPW before they start for work on the grant, and they need FBI or state checks no later than the first day that the hours actually start. Uh, we have lots of information on this. There's a link at the bottom of the page. Uh, so I would encourage you to go there to review it to make sure that you've got several people versed on it to determine uh, for whom this applies. For staff, then, with access to vulnerable populations, there are three components that you need before you can start charging their time to the grant. You need the NSOPW. You need the FBI checks no later than the first day that the hours start. And you need state checks uh, initiated no later than the first day the hours start. So again, there's two checks for people with no access or episodic access, and then there's three checks required for staff with access to vulnerable populations. We also uh, have a new e-course that we're requiring for all of our grantees, and that, that information is available at that link on this page. So you'll be getting a lot more information about criminal history checks in the near future. Uh, this is a good summary of what, what the highlights are to make sure that everyone's aware of. So this really concludes our webinar. There are some sources that we want to uh, provide for you that will have a lot more information and served as the foundation of today's presentation. Uh, we offer a number of financial management online courses. Some are re required for first-time corporation grantees. That will be spelled out uh, in a communication you receive from us if you haven't already received it. Information on the A133 Federal Audit Clearinghouse is also available. System for Award Management, which you must have an active registration in in order to receive federal funds. The Payment Management System, which is going to be very important because that's the entity, as I mentioned, that disperses payments. GuideStar, which has all kinds of information on individual nonprofit organizations, including your SF-990 forms. And then again, uniform guidance uh, resources, which will tie back to 2CFR and other things that are applicable specifically to corporation grantees. So that's a, a link to a place where we've compiled a number of resources that we think will be very helpful to our grantees. Thank you very much for participating in today's webinar. Again, I'm Lisa Bishop. I'm the Grants Officer for the Social Innovation Fund, and this is my email address. Please, please, please don't hesitate to reach out at any time with a question. Uh, we would much rather you ask on the front end than have to ask for forgiveness on the back end. So thanks so much. Take care.